Chapters 15 and 16 of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Read by Mark Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. A Princess of Mars. Chapter 15 Sola Tells Me Her Story. When consciousness returned, and, as I soon learned, I was down but a moment, I sprang quickly to my feet searching for my sword, and there I found it, buried to the hilt in the green breast of Zad, who lay stone dead upon the ochre moss of the ancient sea-bottom. As I regained my full senses, I found his weapon piercing my left breast, but only through the flesh and muscles which cover my ribs entering near the center of my chest and coming out below the shoulder. As I had lunged I had turned, so that his sword merely passed beneath the muscles, inflicting a painful but not dangerous wound. Removing the blade from my body I also regained my own, and turning my back upon his ugly carcass I moved, sick, sore, and disgusted, toward the chariots which bore my retinue and my belongings. A murmur of Martian applause greeted me, but I cared not for it. Bleeding and weak I reached my women, who, accustomed to such happenings, dressed my wounds, applying the wonderful healing and remedial agents, which make only the most instantaneous of death-blows fatal. Giving a Martian woman a chance and death must take a back seat. They soon had me patched up, so that except for weakness from loss of blood, and a little soreness around the wound, I suffered no great distress from this thrust, which, under earthly treatment, undoubtedly would have put me flat on my back for days. As soon as they were through with me, I hastened to the chariot of Deja Thoris, where I found my poor Sola with her chest swathed in bandages, but apparently little the worse for her encounter with Sarkoja whose dagger, it seemed, had struck the edge of one of Sola's metal breast ornaments, and thus deflected, had inflicted but a slight flesh wound. As I approached, I found Deja Thoris lying prone upon her silks and furs, her lithe form racked with sobs. She did not notice my presence, nor did she hear me speaking with Sola, who was standing a short distance from the vehicle. "'Is she injured?' I asked of Sola indicating Deja Thoris by an inclination of my head. "'No,' she answered, "'she thinks that you are dead.' "'And that her grandmother's cat may now have no one to polish its teeth?' I queried, smiling. "'I think you wrong her, John Carter,' said Sola. "'I do not understand either her ways or yours, but I am sure the granddaughter of ten thousand Jeddaks would never grieve like this over any who held but the highest claim upon her affections. They are a proud race, but they are just, as are all Barsoomians, and you must have hurt or wronged her grievously that she will not admit your existence living, though she mourns you dead. Tears are a strange sight upon Barsoom, she continued, and so it is difficult for me to interpret them. I have seen but two people weep in all my life, other than Deja Thoris. One wept from sorrow, the other from baffled rage. The first was my mother, years ago, before they killed her. The other was Sarkoja, when they dragged her from me today. "'Your mother!' I exclaimed. "'But Sola, you could not have known your mother, child.' "'But I did, and my father also,' she added. If you would like to hear the strange and unbarsoomian story, come to the chariot tonight, John Carter, and I will tell you that of which I have never spoken in all my life before. And now the signal has been given to resume the march. You must go. I will come tonight, Sola, I promised. Be sure to tell Deja Thoris I am alive and well. I shall not force myself upon her and be sure that you do not let her know I saw her tears. If she would speak with me, I but await her command." Sola mounted the chariot, 
which was swinging into its place in line, and I hastened to my waiting thoat and galloped to my station beside Tars Tarkas at the rear of the column. We made a most imposing and awe-inspiring spectacle as we strung out across the yellow landscape, the two hundred and fifty ornate and brightly colored chariots, preceded by an advance guard of some two hundred mounted warriors and chieftains, riding five abreast and one hundred yards apart, and followed by a like number in the same formation, with a score or more of flankers on either side. The fifty extra mastodons, or heavy draft animals, known as zitadars, and the five or six hundred extra thoats of the warriors, running loose within the hollow square formed by the surrounding warriors, the gleaming metal and jewels of the gorgeous ornaments of the men and women, duplicated in the trappings of the zitadars and thoats, and interspersed with the flashing colors of magnificent silks and furs and feathers, lent a barbaric splendor to the caravan which would have turned an East Indian potentate green with envy. The enormous broad tires of the chariots and the padded feet of the animals brought forth no sound from the moss-covered sea-bottom, and so we moved in utter silence, like some huge phantasmagoria, except when the stillness was broken by the guttural growling of a goaded zitadar, or the squealing of fighting thoats. The green Martians converse but little, and then, usually in monosyllables, low and like the faint rumbling of distant thunder. We traversed a trackless waste of moss, which, bending to the pressure of broad tire or padded foot, rose up again behind us, leaving no sign that we had passed. We might indeed have been the wraiths of the departed dead upon the dead sea of that dying planet for all the sound or sign we made in passing. It was the first march of a large body of men and animals I had ever witnessed, which raised no dust and left no spore. For there is no dust upon Mars, except in the cultivated districts during the winter months, and even then the absence of high winds renders it almost unnoticeable. We camped that night at the foot of the hills we had been approaching for two days, and which marked the southern boundary of this particular sea. Our animals had been two days without drink, nor had they had water for nearly two months, not since shortly after leaving Thark. But as Tars Tarkas explained to me, they required but little, and can live almost indefinitely upon the moss which covers Barsoom, and which, he told me, holds in its tiny stems sufficient moisture to meet the limited demands of the animals. After partaking of my evening meal, of cheese-like food and vegetable milk, I sought out Sola, whom I found working by the light of a torch upon some of Tars Tarkas' trappings. She looked up at my approach, her face lighting with pleasure and with welcome. "'I am glad you came,' she said. "'Deja Thor sleeps, and I am lonely. Mine own people do not care for me, John Carter. I am too unlike them. It is a sad fate since I must live my life amongst them, and I often wish that I were a true green Martian woman, without love and without hope, but I have known love, and so I am lost. I promise to tell you my story, or rather the story of my parents. From what I have learned of you and the ways of your people, I am sure the tale will not seem strange to you, but among green Martians it has no parallel within the memory of the oldest living Thark, nor do our legends hold many similar tales. My mother was rather small, in fact too small to be allowed the responsibilities of maternity, as our chieftains breed principally for size. She was also less cold and cruel than most green Martian women, and cared little for their society. She often roamed the deserted avenues of Thark alone, or went and sat among the wild flowers that decked the nearby hills, thinking thoughts and wishing wishes which I believe I alone among Tharkian women today may understand, for am I not the child of my mother? And there, among the hills, she met a young warrior, 
whose duty it was to guard the feeding zitadars and thoats and see that they roamed not beyond the hills. They spoke at first only of such things as interest a community of Tharks, but gradually, as they came to meet more often, and was now quite evident to both, no longer by chance, they talked about themselves, their likes, their ambitions, and their hopes. She trusted him and told him of the awful repugnance she felt for the cruelties of their kind, for the hideous, loveless lives they must ever lead, and then she waited for the storm of denunciation to break from his cold, hard lips. But instead he took her in his arms and kissed her. They kept their love a secret for six long years. She, my mother, was of the retinue of the great Tal Hajus, while her lover was a simple warrior, wearing only his own metal. Had their defection from the traditions of the Tharks been discovered, both would have paid the penalty in the great arena before Tal Hajus and the assembled hordes. The egg from which I came was hidden beneath a great glass vessel upon the highest and most inaccessible of the partially ruined towers of ancient Thark. Once each year my mother visited it for the five long years it lay there in the process of incubation. She dared not come oftener, for in the mighty guilt of her conscience she feared that her every move was watched. During this period my father gained great distinction as a warrior and had taken the medal from several chieftains. His love for my mother had never diminished, and his own ambition in life was to reach a point where he might wrest the medal from Tal Hajus himself, and thus, as ruler of the Tharks, be free to claim her as his own, as well as, by the might of his power, protect the child which otherwise would be quickly dispatched should the truth become known. It was a wild dream, that of wresting the metal from Tal Hajus in five short years, but his advance was rapid, and he soon stood high in the councils of Thark. But one day the chance was lost for ever, in so far as it could come in time to save his loved ones, for he was ordered away upon a long expedition to the ice-clad south, to make war upon the natives there and despoil them of their furs for such is the manner of the green Barsoomian. He does not labor for what he can wrest in battle from others. He was gone for four years, and when he returned all had been over for three. For about a year after his departure, and shortly before the time for the return of an expedition which had gone forth to fetch the fruits of a community incubator, the egg had hatched. Thereafter my mother continued to keep me in the old tower, visiting me nightly, and lavishing upon me the love the community life would have robbed us both of. She hoped, upon the return of the expedition from the incubator, to mix me with the other young assigned to the quarters of Tal Hajus, and thus escape the fate which would surely follow discovery of her sin against the ancient traditions of the green men. She taught me rapidly the language and customs of my kind, and one night she told me the story I have told you up to this point, impressing upon me the necessity for absolute secrecy and the great caution I must exercise after she had placed me with the other young Tharks to permit no one to guess that I was further advanced in education than they, nor by any sign to divulge in the presence of others my affection for her or my knowledge of my parentage. And then, drawing me close to her, she whispered in my ear the name of my father. And then a light flashed out upon the darkness of the tower-chamber, and there stood Sarkoja, her gleaming, baleful eyes fixed in a frenzy of loathing and contempt upon my mother. The torrent of hatred and abuse she poured out upon her turned my young heart cold in terror. That she had heard the entire story was apparent, and that she had suspected something wrong from my mother's long nightly absences from her quarters accounted for her presence there on that fateful night. One thing she had not heard, nor did she know, 
the whispered name of my father. This was apparent from her repeated demands upon my mother to disclose the name of her partner in sin, but no amount of abuse or threats could wring this from her, and to save me from needless torture she lied, for she told Sarkoja that she alone knew, nor would she even tell her child. With final imprecations, Sarkoja hastened away to Tal Hajis to report her discovery, and while she was gone my mother, wrapping me in silks and furs of her night coverings, so that I was scarcely noticeable, descended to the streets and ran wildly away toward the outskirts of the city, in the direction which led her to the far south, out toward the man whose protection she might not claim, but on whose face she wished to look once more before she died. As we neared the city's southern extremity, a sound came to us from across the mossy flat, from the direction of the only pass through the hills which led to the gates, the pass by which caravans from either north or south or east or west would enter the city. The sounds we heard were the squeeding of thoats and the grumbling of zitadars, with the occasional clank of arms, which announced the approach of a body of warriors. The thought uppermost in her mind was that it was my father returned from his expedition, but the cunning of the Thark held her from headlong and precipitant flight to greet him. Retreating into the shadows of a doorway, she awaited the coming of the cavalcade which shortly entered the avenue, breaking its formation and thronging the thoroughfare from wall to wall. As the head of the procession passed us, the lesser moon swung clear of the overhanging roofs and lit up the scene with all the brilliancy of her wondrous light. My mother shrank further back into the friendly shadows, and from her hiding-place saw that the expedition was not that of my father, but the returning caravan bearing the young Tharks. Instantly her plan was formed and as a great chariot swung close to our hiding-place she slipped stealthily in upon the trailing tailboard, crouching low in the shadow of the high side, straining me to her bosom in a frenzy of love. She knew what I did not, that never again after that night would she hold me to her breast, nor was it likely we would ever look upon each other's face again. In the confusion of the plaza she mixed me with the other children whose guardians during the journey were now free to relinquish their responsibility. We were herded together into a great room, fed by women who had not accompanied the expedition, and the next day we were parceled out among the retinues of the chieftains. I never saw my mother after that night. She was imprisoned by Tal Hajis, and every effort, including the most horrible and shameful torture, was brought to bear upon her to wring from her lips the name of my father. But she remained steadfast and loyal, dying at last amidst the laughter of Tal Hajis and his chieftains, during some awful torture she was undergoing. I learned afterwards that she told them that she had killed me to save me from a like fate at their hands, and that she had thrown my body to the white apes. Sarkoja alone disbelieved her, and I feel to this day that she suspects my true origin, but does not dare expose me, at the present at all events, because she also guesses, I am sure, the identity of my father. When he returned from his expedition and learned the story of my mother's fate, I was present as Tal Hajis told him but never by the quiver of a muscle did he betray the slightest emotion. Only he did not laugh as Tal Hajis gleefully described her death struggles. From that moment on he was the cruelest of the cruel, and I am awaiting the day when he shall win the goal of his ambition and feel the carcass of Tal Hajis beneath his foot, for I am sure that he but waits the opportunity to wreak a terrible vengeance, and that his great love is as strong in his breast as when it first transfigured him nearly forty years ago. As I am that we sit here upon the edge of a world-old ocean, 
while sensible people sleep, John Carter. And your father, Sola, is he with us now? I asked. Yes, she replied, but he does not know me for what I am, nor does he know who betrayed my mother to Tal Hajus. I alone know my father's name, and only I and Tal Hajus and Sarkoja know that it was she who carried the tale that brought death and torture upon her he loved. We sat silent for a few moments, she wrapped in the gloomy thoughts of her terrible past, and I in pity for the poor creatures whom the heartless, senseless customs of their race had doomed to loveless lives of cruelty and of hate. Presently she spoke. John Carter, if ever a real man walked the cold, dead bosom of Barsoom, you are one. I know that I can trust you, and because the knowledge may some day help you, or him, or Dejah Thoris, or myself, I am going to tell you the name of my father, nor place any restrictions or conditions upon your tongue. When the time comes, speak the truth, if it seems best to you. I trust you because I know that you are not cursed with the terrible trait of absolute and unswerving truthfulness, that you could lie, like one of your own Virginia gentlemen, if a lie would save others from sorrow or suffering. My father's name is Tars Tarkas. CHAPTER Sixteen: WE PLAN ESCAPE The remainder of our journey to Thark was uneventful. We were twenty days upon the road, crossing two sea-bottoms and passing through or around a number of ruined cities, mostly smaller than Korad. Twice we crossed the famous Martian waterways, or canals, so called by our earthly astronomers. When we approached these points, a warrior would be sent far ahead with a powerful field-glass, and if no great body of red Martian troops was in sight, we would advance as close as possible without chance of being seen, and then camp until dark, when we would slowly approach the cultivated tract, and locating one of the numerous broad highways which crossed these areas at regular intervals, creep silently and stealthily across the arid lands upon the other side. It required five hours to make one of these crossings without a single halt, and the other consumed the entire night so that we were just leaving the confines of the high-walled fields when the sun broke out upon us. Crossing in the darkness as we did, I was unable to see but little, except as the nearer moon, in her wild and ceaseless hurtling through the Barsoomian heavens, lit up little patches of the landscape from time to time, disclosing walled fields and low rambling buildings, presenting much the appearance of earthly farms. There were many trees, methodically arranged, and some of them were of enormous height. There were animals in some of the enclosures, and they announced their presence by terrified squealings and snortings, as they scented our queer, wild beasts and wilder human beings. Only once did I perceive a human being, and that was at the intersection of our crossroad with the wide, white turnpike which cuts each cultivated district longitudinally at its exact center. The fellow must have been sleeping beside the road, for as I came abreast of him he raised upon one elbow and after a single glance at the approaching caravan leaped shrieking to his feet and fled madly down the road, scaling a nearby wall with the agility of a scared cat. The Tharks paid him not the slightest attention. They were not out upon the warpath and the only sign that I had that they had seen him was a quickening of the pace of the caravan as we hastened toward the bordering desert which marked our entrance into the realm of Tal Hajus. Not once did I have speech with Dejah Thoris, as she sent no word to me that I would be welcome at her chariot, and my foolish pride kept me from making any advances. I verily believe that a man's way with women is in inverse ratio to his prowess among men. The weakling and the saphead have often great ability to charm the fair sex, while the fighting man who can face a thousand real dangers unafraid sits hiding in the shadows like some frightened child. 
Just thirty days after my advent upon Barsoom, we entered the ancient city of Thark, from whose long-forgotten people this horde of green men have stolen even their name. The hordes of Thark number some thirty thousand souls, and are divided into twenty-five communities. Each community has its own Jed and lesser chieftains, but all are under the rule of Tal Hajis, Jeddak of Thark. Five communities make their headquarters at the city of Thark, and the balance are scattered among the other deserted cities of ancient Mars throughout the district claimed by Tal Hajis. We made our entry into the great city plaza early in the afternoon. There were no enthusiastic friendly greetings for the returned expedition. Those who chanced to be in sight spoke the names of warriors or women with whom they came in direct contact, in the formal greeting of their kind. But when it was discovered that they brought two captives a greater interest was aroused, and Dejah Thoris and I were the centers of inquiring groups. We were soon assigned to new quarters and the balance of the day was devoted to settling ourselves to the changed conditions. My home now was upon an avenue leading into the plaza from the south, the main artery down which we had marched from the gates of the city. I was at the far end of the square and had an entire building to myself. The same grandeur of architecture which was so noticeable a characteristic of Korad was in evidence here only, if that were possible, on a larger and richer scale. My quarters would have been suitable for housing the greatest of earthly emperors, but to these queer creatures nothing about a building appealed to them but its size and the enormity of its chambers. The larger the building, the more desirable. And so Tal Hajis occupied what must have been an enormous public building, the largest in the city but entirely unfitted for residence purposes. The next largest was reserved for Lorquas Tomel, the next for the Jed of a lesser rank, and so on to the bottom of the list of five Jeds. The warriors occupied the buildings with the chieftains to whose retinues they belonged, or, if they preferred, sought shelter among any of the thousands of untenanted buildings in their own quarter of town, each community being assigned a certain section of the city. The selection of building had to be made in accordance with these divisions, except, in so far as the Jeds were concerned, they all occupying edifices which fronted upon the plaza. When I had finally put my house in order, or rather seen that it had been done, it was nearing sunset, and I hastened out with the intention of locating Sola and her charges, as I had determined upon having speech with Dejah Thoris and trying to impress on her the necessity of our at least patching up a truce until I could find some way of aiding her to escape. I searched in vain until the upper rim of the great red sun was just disappearing behind the horizon, and then I spied the ugly head of Woola peering from a second-story window on the opposite side of the very street where I was quartered, but nearer the plaza. Without waiting for a further invitation, I bolted up the winding runway which led to the second floor, and entering a great chamber at the front of the building was greeted by the frenzied Woola, who threw his great carcass upon me, nearly hurling me to the floor. The poor old fellow was so glad to see me that I thought he would devour me, his head split from ear to ear, showing his three rows of tusks in his hobgoblin smile. Quieting him with a word of command and a caress, I looked hurriedly through the approaching gloom for a sign of Dejah Thoris, and then, not seeing her, I called her name. There was an answering murmur from the far corner of the apartment, and with a couple of quick strides I was standing beside her where she crouched among the furs and silks upon an ancient carved wooden seat. As I waited she rose to her full height and looked me straight in the eye, and said, what would Dotar Sojat, Thark, of Dejah Thoris, his captive? Dejah Thoris, I do not know how I have angered you. It was furtherest from my desire to hurt or offend you, whom I had hoped to protect and comfort. Have none of me if it is your will, but that you must aid me in effecting your escape, if such a thing is possible, is not my request, but my command. When you are safe once more at your father's court, you may do with me as you please. 
but from now on until that day I am your master, and you must obey and aid me." She looked at me long and earnestly, and I thought that she was softening toward me. "'I understand your words, Dotar Sojat,' she replied, "'but you I do not understand. You are a queer mixture of child and man, of brute and noble. I only wish that I might read your heart." Look down at your feet, Dejah Thoris. It lies there now, where it has lain since that other night at Korad, and where it will ever lie, beating alone for you, until death stills it forever." She took a little step toward me, her beautiful hands outstretched in a strange groping gesture. "'What do you mean, John Carter?' she whispered. "'What are you saying to me?' I am saying what I had promised myself that I would not say to you, at least until you were no longer a captive among the green men. What from your attitude toward me for the past twenty days I had thought never to say to you. I am saying, Dejah Thoris, that I am yours, body and soul, to serve you, to fight for you, and to die for you. Only one thing I ask of you in return, and that is that you make no sign either of condemnation or of approbation of my words, until you are safe among your own people, and that whatever sentiments you harbor toward me they be not influenced or colored by gratitude. Whatever I may do to serve you will be prompted solely from selfish motives, since it gives me more pleasure to serve you than not. I will respect your wishes, John Carter, because I understand the motives which prompt them and I accept your service no more willingly than I bow to your authority. Your word shall be my law. I have twice wronged you in my thoughts, and again I ask your forgiveness." Further conversation of a personal nature was prevented by the entrance of Sola, who was much agitated and wholly unlike her usual calm and possessed self. "'That horrible Sarkoja has been before Tal Hajis, she cried and from what I heard upon the plaza there is little hope for either of you." "'What do they say?' inquired Dejah Thoris. "'That you will be thrown to the wild calots dogs, in the great arena as soon as the hordes have assembled for the yearly games.' "'Sola,' I said, "'you are a Thark, but you hate and loathe the customs of your people as much as we do. Will you not accompany us in one supreme effort to escape?' I am sure that Dejah Thoris can offer you a home and protection among her people, and your fate can be no worse among them than it must ever be here." "'Yes,' cried Dejah Thoris, "'come with us, Sola. You will be better off among the red men of Helium than you are here, and I can promise you not only a home with us, but the love and affection your nature craves, and which must always be denied you by the customs of your own race. Come with us, Sola. We might go without you, but your fate would be terrible if they thought you had connived to aid us. I know that even fear would not tempt you to interfere in our escape. But we want you with us. We want you to come to a land of sunshine and happiness, amongst a people who know the meaning of love, of sympathy, and of gratitude. Say that you will, Sola. Tell me that you will. The great waterway which leads to Helium is but fifty miles to the south," murmured Sola, half to herself. A swift thought might make it in three hours, and then to Helium is five hundred miles, most of the way through thinly settled districts. They would know, and they would follow us. We might hide among the great trees for a time, but the chances are small indeed for escape. They would follow us to the very gates of Helium and they would take toll of life at every step. You do not know them." "'Is there no other way we might reach Helium?' I asked. "'Can you not draw me a rough map of the country we must traverse, Dejah Thoris?' "'Yes,' she replied. And taking a great diamond from her hair, she drew upon the marble floor the first map of Barsoomian territory I had ever seen. It was criss-crossed in every direction with long straight lines sometimes running parallel and sometimes converging toward some great circle. The lines, she said, were waterways, the circles cities, 
and one far to the northwest of us she pointed out as Helium. There were other cities closer, but she said she feared to enter many of them, as they were not all friendly toward Helium. Finally, after studying the map carefully in the moonlight which now flooded the room, I pointed out a waterway far to the north of us which also seemed to lead to Helium. "'Does this not pierce your grandfather's territory?' I asked. "'Yes,' she answered. "'But it is two hundred miles north of us. It is one of the waterways we crossed on the trip to Thark.' "'They would never suspect that we would try for that distant waterway,' I answered and that is why I think that is the best route for our escape." Sola agreed with me, and it was decided that we should leave Thark this same night, just as quickly, in fact, as I could find and saddle my thoats. Sola was to ride one, and Dejah Thoris and I the other, each of us carrying sufficient food and drink to last us for two days, since the animals could not be urged too rapidly for so long a distance. I directed Sola to proceed with Dejah Thoris along one of the less frequented avenues to the southern boundary of the city, where I would overtake them with the thoats as quickly as possible. Then, leaving them to gather what food, silks, and furs we were to need, I slipped quietly to the rear of the first floor, and entered the courtyard where our animals were moving restlessly about, as was their habit, before settling down for the night. In the shadows of the buildings, and out beneath the radiance of the Martian moons, moved the great herd of Thotes and Zitidars, the latter grunting their low gutturals, and the former occasionally emitting the sharp squeal which denotes the almost habitual state of rage in which these creatures pass their existence. They were quieter now, owing to the absence of man, but as they scented me they became more restless and their hideous noise increased. It was risky business, this entering a paddock of thoats alone and at night. First, because their increasing noisiness might warn the nearby warriors that something was amiss. And also, because for the slightest cause, or for no cause at all, some great bull thoat might take it upon himself to lead a charge upon me. Having no desire to awaken their nasty tempers upon such a night as this, where so much depended upon secrecy and dispatch, I hugged the shadows of the buildings, ready, at an instant's warning, to leap into the safety of a nearby door or window. Thus I moved silently to the great gates, which opened upon the street at the back of the court, and as I neared the exit I called softly to my two animals. How I thanked the kind providence which had given me the foresight to win the love and confidence of these wild dumb brutes, for presently, from the far side of the court, I saw two huge bulks forcing their way toward me through the surging mountains of flesh. They came quite close to me, rubbing their muzzles against my body, and nosing for the bits of food it was always my practice to reward them with. Opening the gates, I ordered the two great beasts to pass out, and then slipping quietly after them I closed the portals behind me. I did not saddle or mount the animals there but instead walked quietly in the shadows of the buildings, toward an unfrequented avenue which led toward the point I had arranged to meet Dejah Thoris and Sola. With the noiselessness of disembodied spirits we moved stealthily among the deserted streets, but not until we were within sight of the plain beyond the city did I commence to breathe freely. I was sure that Sola and Dejah Thoris would find no difficulty in reaching our rendezvous undetected. But with my great thoats I was not so sure for myself, as it was quite unusual for warriors to leave the city after dark. In fact, there was no place for them to go within any but a long ride. I reached the appointed meeting place safely, but as Dejah Thoris and Sola were not there, I led my animals into the entrance hall of one of the large buildings. Presuming that one of the other women of the same household may have come in to speak to Sola, and so delayed their departure, I did not feel any undue apprehension until nearly an hour had passed without a sign of them, and by the time another half-hour had crawled away I was becoming filled with grave anxiety. Then there broke upon the stillness of the night the sound of an approaching party, which, from the noise, I knew could be no fugitives creeping stealthily toward liberty. Soon the party was near me, and from the black shadows of my entranceway 
I perceived a score of mounted warriors, who in passing dropped a dozen words that fetched my heart clean into the top of my head. He would likely have arranged to meet them just without the city, and so— I heard no more. They had passed on, but it was enough. Our plan had been discovered, and the chances for escape from now on to the fearful end would be small indeed. My one hope now was to return undetected to the quarters of Dejah Thoris and learn what fate had overtaken her, but how to do it with these great monstrous thoats upon my hands, now that the city probably was aroused by the knowledge of my escape, was a problem of no mean proportions. Suddenly an idea occurred to me, and acting on my knowledge of the construction of the buildings of these ancient Martian cities, with a hollow court within the center of each square, I groped my way blindly through the dark chambers, calling the great thoats after me. They had difficulty in negotiating some of the doorways, but as the buildings fronting the city's principal exposures were all designed upon a magnificent scale, they were able to wriggle through without sticking fast, and thus we finally made the inner court where I found, as I had expected, the usual carpet of moss-like vegetation which would prove their food and drink until I could return them to their own enclosure. That they would be as quiet and contented here as elsewhere, I was confident nor was there but the remotest possibility that they would be discovered, as the green men had no great desire to enter these outlying buildings, which were frequented by the only thing, I believe, which caused them the sensation of fear, the great white apes of Barsoom. Removing the saddle trappings, I hid them just within the rear doorway of the building through which we had entered the court, and turning the beasts loose, quickly made my way across the court to the rear of the buildings upon the further side, and thence to the avenue beyond. Waiting in the doorway of the building until I was assured that no one was approaching, I hurried across to the opposite side and through the first doorway to the court beyond. Thus crossing through court after court, with only the slight chance of detection which the necessary crossing of the avenues entailed, I made my way in safety to the courtyard in the rear of Dejah Thoris quarters. Here, of course, I found the beasts of the warriors who quartered in the adjacent buildings, and the warriors themselves I might expect to meet within if I entered. But fortunately for me I had another and safer method of reaching the upper story where Dejah Thoris should be found and after first determining as nearly as possible which of the buildings she occupied, for I had never observed them before from the court side, I took advantage of my relatively great strength and agility, and sprang upward until I grasped the sill of a second-story window, which I thought to be in the rear of her apartment. Drawing myself inside the room, I moved stealthily toward the front of the building, and not until I had quite reached the doorway of her room was I made aware by voices that it was occupied. I did not rush headlong in, but listened without to assure myself that it was Dejah Thoris, and that it was safe to venture within. It was well indeed that I took this precaution, for the conversation I heard was in the low gutturals of men, and the words which finally came to me proved a most timely warning. The speaker was a chieftain and he was giving orders to four of his warriors. And when he returns to this chamber, he was saying, as he surely will when he finds she does not meet him at the city's edge, you four are to spring upon him and disarm him. It will require the combined strength of all of you to do it if the reports they bring back from Korad are correct. When you have him fast bound, bear him to the vaults beneath the Jeddak's quarters, and chain him securely where he may be found when Tal Hajis wishes him. Allow him to speak with none, nor permit any other to enter this apartment before he comes. There will be no danger of the girl returning, for by this time she is safe in the arms of Tal Hajis, and may all her ancestors have pity upon her, for Tal Hajis will have none. The great Sarkoja has done a noble knight's work. I go and if you fail to capture him when he comes, I commend your carcasses to the cold bosom of Is. End of chapter 16